Hi there Smart Drivers, Rick with Smart Drive Test today talking to you about road signs. Road signs will allow you to interpret traffic patterns, be more proactive in your driving, and be a smarter and safer driver overall. Stick around, we'll be right back with that information. Hi there Smart Drivers, welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about traffic signs, how to read traffic signs and you should be able to read and interpret the information on traffic signs at a glance, especially for the purposes of a road test and being safe on the roadway. Uh, road signs are divided into classifications, regulatory signs, school signs, cautionary signs, uh, hazard obstruction signs and whatnot. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Help you to pass a road test and be safe on the roadways. Corey's here, Bricks for Wheels. Corey is the moderator and does an excellent job at keeping out the bad people <laughs> who like to spam the channels once you get a little bit bigger. Uh, Rich is here, tuning in from Maine, and Carrie is here from Minnesota. France just passed a uh, road test, I believe. Congratulations, France. That's awesome. So if you're just tuning in, uh, let us know where you're tuning in from in the world, what class of license you're going for, when you have your test, sort of how far along on the road test preparation route you are, and whether you're looking for defensive driving or whatnot, we have a special offer for you today as well on the defensive driving course over at the Smart Drive Test website. You can find that over there. And it's currently on special. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the presentation. And uh, if you're watching on the replay, as well, uh, Smart Drive Test helps new drivers get a license, veteran drivers to remain crash free, and CDL drivers to start a career as a truck or bus driver. So if you're new here, consider subscribing as well, hit that thumbs up, and definitely leave us a comment. Love comments, love helping you out, love helping you to get a license or start a new career. And the other thing that I'm doing is a live stream in the morning on Wednesdays uh, for specifically for CDL drivers who are considering changing careers or getting another job, you know, because maybe the one you're currently at isn't fulfilling life expectations or paying the bills. And there's a lot more month left at the end of the, you know, when all the money runs out and those sorts of things. So you're trying to pay the bills and do those sorts of things. And I can tell you right now that uh, truck driving, in my own experience, I've it, you know it's supported my hobby of going to university, which it can be expensive, and so I've always done that. Uh, Brenda's here, New Jersey, Class D, March six. So, uh, Brenda, just let me know, Class D, is that car license in New Jersey, or is that a commercial license in New Jersey? Sissy, I'm joining uh, from New Jersey. I find your videos very helpful. Excellent, glad we can help out. And uh, Brandon's here from Louisville, Kentucky. Awesome, 380's here. And uh, Pandy joining from Washington, Washington State or Washington DC? Probably Washington State. So that's great, few people here. And uh, as I said, we're gonna talk today about road signs. So without further ado, <laughs> We'll get going on the road signs here and do the presentation. So Brenda, that's car, awesome, great. You're going for your first license, brilliant. And if you have any questions at all or you're struggling with any part of your learning how to drive, how to drive a car, how to drive a manual car, we have heaps and heaps of videos here. I'm doing tons of work uh, right now and sort of reconceptualizing the channel. Uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, looking on Google to see what questions you're asking. Uh, interesting, this is probably something I should have been doing for the past three years, trying to figure out exactly what questions you're asking and how I can best answer those questions because uh, the language that we use is, it's, it's a blunt tool to say the least. So, and why I say that is because I have a particular language that I use when I teach driving, but that language isn't necessarily the same questions, the same way that you're going to be asking it. So if there's something that I'm not saying right or something that you don't understand, uh, let me know in the comments and I'll definitely do my best to try and rework my language because uh, one of the smart drivers here's an example of what I'm trying to say so one of one of the things that I said in the air brake course is, is that there's there's one brake 
two power sources and the, the brake serves three purposes. And the smart driver said to me that I was confusing people because I said there were three brakes. There's a service brake, a parking brake, and an emergency brake. And all cars have that, right? When you go up and down the road, you press down on the brake pedal, we call that the service brake. And, but that's not language you're gonna use. You're just gonna call it the brake pedal. But in, when we teach air brakes, we call it the service brake. And then the parking brake, obviously you pull up on the lever or push down on the pedal in your car. Air brake equipped vehicles, CDL vehicles have the same thing. And then there's an emergency brake. So if the brakes fail for whatever reason, there's an emergency brake. In your car, you just use the parking brake as your emergency brake and you apply it manually. In air brake systems, it's automatic. And so when the smart driver left me that comment, it was really good feedback for me because it helps me to teach better because now I have to rethink how I'm saying stuff and how I'm using language to communicate the ideas that I'm trying to communicate to you so that you can pass your test. And, and so I'm, I'm thinking a lot more about that, about how I can help you better. All right, so Roni's here. My road test will be Thursday, January 30th in Calgary. Awesome, first time, you're gonna do great. Uh, Brandon got his license three weeks ago, 100% on my road test. That is absolutely stellar news, Brendan. Uh, Brandon, rather, sorry. Uh, 380, speaking of standards, can you float a six speed? Uh, six speed in a car, 380, or th six speed in a truck? You can both. It's it's a little harder in a non or in a synchromesh transmission, which is what you're going to find in a car. Hamad, uh, hi sir. Uh, you are doing a great job. God bless you. Thank you so much, Hamad. Happy to hear we can help out. Alan, testing for CDL Class B permit tomorrow here in Central Florida with a Class B permit. Can I drive a tractor without a trailer? Uh, you can. You can without a trailer. It's, uh, it's going to be unlikely that a company is going to let you do that. And the reason for that is not because you don't hold the right license. It's because of insurance. That's that's the reason. Uh, so 380 said exactly what I said. The only thing, the only question comes up is is insurance. Okay, so Maxi's here as well. All right, so let's get going on road signs. Uh, these road signs that I'm talking about and talking about classifications and those types of things aren't just for passenger vehicles. These are for CDL drivers as well. <laughs> and I will tell you a story about CDL drivers. Back in the day when I hadn't quite become a driving instructor yet, uh, I was mentoring a new driver that we were trying to get hired for the company that I was working for. And I knew I had a lot of experience driving truck. I had a lot of experience driving in the United States and driving in all the states in the United States, driving in New York, driving in Jersey. And I knew the importance of driving truck and 380 can say this to me, probably tell me, you know, he'll probably say the same thing that I did. Signs become more important as you get into commercial vehicles. They're really important when you're driving a car, but they're even more important because there's more signs to know when you're driving a commercial vehicle. And I was trying to Im impress upon this driver, this new driver, how important it was to read road signs. So we went and picked up the load, we're coming back. I asked him three or four times, what was the last road sign you saw? And he wasn't catching on to the game. <laughs> and finally, I said to him, I said, pull the truck over. I said, what was the last sign we saw? And it, and it, was, a, it was a speed sign. He said, I don't know. I said, pull the truck over. I made him pull the truck over. He got, I said, go back, run back, and look at what that sign is. So he, he had to run back and look at what the sign was. And it was probably a good half a kilometer back before, you know. So it is incredibly important to look at road signs. So here we go with the presentation. All right, so road signs. We're talking about road signs today for both passing a road test, staying safe, and these are for CDL drivers as well. And if you can put them into classifications, it's going to be easier. All right, so uh, I did talk about this previous. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more right now. Defensive driving, part of defensive driving is road signs. Okay, so it's currently on special over at the Smart Drive Test website. Corey, I'll put that link up for you. These are the topics that I cover. Common crashes, the four crashes, T-bone crashes, head-on collisions, side swipe crashes, and rear end collisions. And I give you strategies to prevent being involved in those crashes. Backing crashes, I also talk about backing and safe backing. I talk about intersections and turning because 40% of crashes happen to intersections. I talk about night driving and inclement weather driving, distracted driving, drowsing drivers. 
Uh, that, drowsy drivers rest in pieces. And then finally I talk about route planning and navigation. For new drivers, this is one of the struggles that you're going to have as a new driver. So that course is currently on special. If you're not completely satisfied within 60 days, I will give you your money back on that course, but it is a great course and it will keep you safe on the road, roadways, make you smarter and reduce your chances of being involved in a collision. For those of you who are new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. Uh, I was a truck driver through most of the 1990s running LTL, which is less than load, which means you got 10 or 12 drops on a trailer. Ran into the United States for a period of time and drove tractor trailer units into New York City uh, and the other urban populations around Jersey. Uh, licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. Most of my career has been teaching truck drivers, but I've also taught cars as well and taught driver rehabilitation. So people who uh, were learning to drive with hand controls because they had some sort of a spinal cord injury or missing a limb or whatnot. Uh, 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne in Australia with a doctorate in legal history. Uh, and for those of you who may or may not know, legal history is a study of policing, courts, and prisons. My expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic, oddly enough. And while I was going to university, I taught, or not taught, but I drove part-time for Greyhound. And Australians are fond of saying that they founded Greyhound. Never followed up on that, but uh, <laughs> that's what they say. All right, so road signs convey information in three ways. The first way is the shape of the sign. Rectangular signs are most often regulatory signs and the root word of regulatory is regulation. It means that you have to obey the sign. It's law. All right. The colors. Most cautionary signs are black lettering or symbols on yellow backgrounds. Uh, construction signs are orange signs uh, with black lettering. For example, uh, here in Canada, uh, school signs are pentagon. They're the shape of a house and they're usually white on neon green backgrounds in the United States. They can be different colors. They'd be blue with white writing and whatnot. And then the final way that signs convey information is words and symbols. Now there's some signs obviously that are going to be more important than other signs. There are some cautionary signs that you can kind of give a glance to and yes they're important but in it's in in information that could be potentially important, but most of the time it's not going to be. You know, deer in the area, for example, <laughs> deer crossing or whatnot. Uh, most of the time, yes, you're aware of it, but there really isn't anything to do you can do if a, an animal jumps out in front of you. We can talk about that a little bit more, but those are the three ways that road signs convey information. Road sign classes, regulatory signs, as I said, they are regulation, speed signs, brake check signs, Stop signs, yield signs, railway crossing signs, those are all examples of regulatory signs. School signs, uh, school in area, and I would have to say that the school signs are probably the least consistent of all of the traffic signs. I went around here and did a video on it, Corey will put that video up for you as well, and uh, there was a lot of inconsistency in school signs, and really the only one that you have to pay attention to is the school speed zone sign, and as I tell drivers who are going for a road test, practice in and around the test center, figure out where the schools are and where the school zone signs are. You only have to obey school signs when school is in session. So summer holidays, Christmas holidays, or on weekends, you don't have to obey school speed zone signs, okay? Cautionary signs, uh, tons and tons of cautionary signs, lane control signs, object marker signs, and I'll talk a little bit more about object marker signs because they're probably the most prolific signs on our roadways. And there's three object marker signs that you will encounter on the roadways. And these are the hash marks. Hash marks to pass on the right, hash marks to pass on the left, or hash marks are chevrons to tell you to pass either right or left. And they're usually a rectangular sign, as you can see here in the image. And, uh, the way that you re remember uh, which, sign, which side of the object marker sign to pass on is think of a kettle of water being poured onto the hash marks and whichever way the water runs off is uh, the side of the sign on which you drive. And these will warn you of all kinds of things, bridge embutments, getting off freeways where there's a divide like a concrete barrier, 
uh, signs. They'll be on signs. They'll be on residential streets where the where they have um, uh, traffic reduction. So trying to slow the speed down and the curb will come out. They'll have an object marker sign on there and those types of things. So you and these become incredibly important for larger vehicles. The more you you start getting into towing trailers, driving buses or trucks or those types of things be aware of where object marker signs are on the roadway and uh, they'll keep you safe okay regular regulatory signs as I said stop signs speed signs railway crossings brake check signs and brake check signs for those of you hauling trailers driving buses driving trucks you have to stop at a brake check area and check your brakes so know that okay and pay attention to these signs for the purposes of a road test you have to come to a complete stop at the stop at the correct position at the stop signed intersection before the stop line before the uh, sidewalk before the crosswalk line and if those two conditions don't exist then at the edge of the road where the two roads meet is where you need to stop for the purposes of a road uh, road test okay Cautionary signs, these are everywhere. They're usually diamond shaped signs. Uh, they're warning signs, usually diamond shaped. They have a yellow background with black lettering on them and they're the same almost everywhere in the world. Uh, some are relevant and some are not so much, okay? Usually on curves, when you have a regulatory sign, it says 45 kilometers an hour. That is an advisory speed. You don't necessarily have to adhere to that. Uh, but if you're new to the area or haven't been in the area or driven there before, then definitely slow down and keep an eye out of what the road is doing and where it might be changing so, to know whether you need to adhere to that regulatory sign. Okay, larger signs, destination signs, overhead signs, and match the uh, speed of the flow of traffic. I tell you, after you get your license, not on a road test, on a road test you have to adhere to the posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less, but after you get your license, I tell you, keep up with the flow of traffic. You will be much more predictable and much safer on the roadways, okay? If you insist on doing the posted speed limit after you get your license, you are going to have a huge line of people behind you if you were on a two-lane highway, I guarantee you that because part of social driving is driving above the speed limit five or ten kilometers an hour i mean unless you're in australia where they have speed cameras everywhere and believe it or not most people drive the posted speed limit there which is which is very different a very different driving culture all right so know that as well oh and just get back here there we go lane you should signs these are probably one of the least adhered to signs but it becomes very important when you drive a bigger vehicle, especially if you're driving a truck and a trailer. Uh, you need to be in the right-hand lane, the outside lane, if you're turning with a larger vehicle, okay? Be sure that you're in the correct lane for uh, both driving a larger vehicle. And if you're not confident in driving and those types of things, uh, know that you want to be in the right-hand lane if you're going to if there's multi lanes going to the left because that way it'll put you in the right-hand lane when you get around the corner. You don't have to change lanes. All right, overhead usage signs. Uh, these are overhead and they're needed in the in the summer or rather in the spring because the plowing and those types of things have, have uh, worn most of the road markings off. So you're going to have to look up and pay attention to these. And as I said, be in the right-hand lane for multi turns on these. And also there's a video. Uh, turning on multi lanes and Corey will put that up for you as well mile marker signs now here's a really good one uh, that I need you to pay attention to especially if you're driving on freeways or you're driving on interstates and those types of things and these are numbered uh, and are sequential okay uh, here in the province of British Columbia east to west on the Trans Canada uh, it starts at zero in Vancouver and as you head east increases in number okay and in the United States for example if you're heading north south uh, on say on interstate 75 and you start in state of Ohio in Toledo it's mile marker 213 and you drive 213 miles south across interstate 75 as you're going through the state of Ohio so they are numbered uh, all the interstates as well as you can see here in the image it's on exit numbers as well the only state that I'm aware of uh, there are 
there's an inter the turnpike in Oklahoma as well. It doesn't line up with the X numbers. The state of New York, it doesn't line up with the X numbers, but most states in the US, the mile markers line up with the exit numbers. And if you're traveling to some place you haven't been to before, for example, uh, you're going to a new destination, look it up on Google and make sure you get the exit number. Uh, it, can, it can really help you out and reduce your anxiety when you're driving because when you're going down the road, say for example, you're gonna get off at exit 275, you're at exit 276, or you're getting off at 275, you're at exit 265. So you know that you have 10 miles to go to 275 and you can get over to the right hand lane and then look for exit uh, 275 and just get off at that time. Now, in terms of defensive driving, and I've had this happen with commercial drivers, teaching them to drive when they're at trucking school. I used to teach route planning and navigation and we were in Kelowna, or we were in Kamloops rather, and we're going up the hill at Kamloops and the student was in behind a bigger truck that was going slower than he was and he, sa he said to me, oh, do we have time to pass him? Because he knew he was gonna get off the road a ways up a little bit, he, but he didn't know how far. And, I, and we just went right past the mile marker and I said, well, what's the mile marker? He said, well, it's 268. I said, which one are we getting off at? He said, we're getting off at 275. So it was eight kilometers up the road. I said, well, how far is that? He didn't know that the mile markers tell you how far it is along the roadway. So from where we were to where he was getting off, it was eight kilometers, so he still had plenty of time to get out and around the truck and get back in to get off hit his exit. So mile markers are a really great navigation tool as well. They're really good defensively and will reduce your anxiety when you're driving on interstates and freeways because you know exactly where you are in that interstate or freeway, especially if you know what the mile marker is when you get off the interstate, where you're getting off the interstate, okay? So pay attention to those and take note of those as well. And again, just remind you, the defensive driving course is on special right now. We'll keep you safe on the roadways and give you valuable in, uh, information to reduce being involved in a crash. So good luck on your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. All right, so the rest of it will be questions and answers. So if you have any questions and answer questions about passing a road test, staying safe on the roadways. Cody is here. How are you, my friend? I like the map in the background. Pretty. <laughs> it gives you something to look at while we're talking here and helping you to pass a road test. Uh, excellent. Oh, bye. You're getting your road test in 40 minutes. Awesome. Congratulations on that. Good luck on that. Remember... Take away the examiner's right to fail you. That's all you need to do. Nothing less, nothing more. Um, 380 as well. Many places there are slower roads. If you do not feel comfortable on the highway, just try and go anywhere close to the limit on the 401. You'd be crushed into a cube. <laughs> yeah, the 401. Uh, we're talking about the freeway in Ontario that runs um, west to east from Detroit, Michigan. Well, it starts in Windsor, which is Detroit, Michigan and runs through to Montreal. Uh, that's an interesting piece of highway. <laughs> uh, I, I did hear rumors that they increased the speed limit on the 401, uh, but I know when I was living in Ontario years ago that uh, the speed limit in Ontario was 100 kilometers an hour, and I know that most people on the 401 drew, drove 140. So I don't know whether that's changed much, if it's still the same or not. Maxi, if I exit a highway into another highway through a ramp whereby the speed limit on the ramp is 70 kilometers an hour, do we follow this limit or do we continue at a speed of 100 kilometers an hour? No, Maxi, you definitely have to slow down on an on-ramp. Excellent question. And whatever the cautionary speed is, yes. And this is why when you're going for a road test that I suggest to you uh, drive in and around the test center at the time that you're going to be taking your test. That way when you get off on the freeway, you know uh, how much you have to slow down. You, and if you haven't got off of that freeway before on that exit ramp, then do what the posted, what the warning sign suggests that you slow down. And especially for those of you in big trucks or driving trailers, make sure that you slow down to the, the advised speed limit on the cautionary sign. <laughs> Just because you don't have to uh, adhere to that, I strongly recommend that you're in or around that speed, okay? If you, the more experience you get, uh, the more you know how much you can kind of go past that, but for the purposes of learning how to drive and passing your road test, 
make sure you're as close to that advisory speed as you can. And as I said, the bigger the vehicle, uh, the more you're going to have to adhere to that speed limit. And the other thing is, is that you can watch lots of videos on YouTube <laughs> about truck rollovers on off ramps and it happens all the time so know that okay uh cody sweaty in the winter do you have any tips uh, <laughs> uh what do you need tips for cody do you need tips tips to reduce anxiety about driving in the winter time because yeah it is you can be anxious in the winter time no doubt about it colin my friend how are you excellent so happy to uh, see you here on the channel uh uh, are you talking about the sports player that was killed in the helicopter crash? Is that, that's very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. Uh, Cody, good luck on your test. Just know that for me, waiting to take the test was more nerve-wracking than actually taking the test itself. And yes, and that is a great point about being anxious and being nervous for a test. Know that the first five or ten minutes is going to be really nerve-wracking. It's actually once you get in the vehicle, once you get started, you're going to do all right, okay? And know that the first five minutes, just focus on what you're doing. And if you go into the test center, regardless of where you are, uh, this isn't for CDL people because for CDL people, there'll be a specific place where you have to park the bus or truck. But for car people, unless there are signs prohibiting you backing into the parking space, when you go into the test center, back into the parking space, that way when you come out and you're ready to go, uh, the examiner is going to come out, he, he or she will introduce him or herself to you, and then he or she is going to do a little pre-trip inspection on your car. They're going to check, make sure that the lights work, the signals work, if it's raining, they're going to make sure the windshield wipers work, they're going to make sure that the brake lights work, they're going to get in the vehicle, they're going to make sure that the seatbelt works and whatnot, uh, they're going to ask you to bang the horn, make sure that the horn works and whatnot. So know that they're going to do a little pre-trip inspection make sure that you do a pre-trip inspection on your vehicle before you show up Corey will put the video up for you on that as well and then you're just going to drive out and follow the directions most driving examiners are really good about you know at the next block turn left at the controlled intersection turn right Controlled intersections, for those of you who may or may not know, are stop signs, yield signs, traffic lights. Those are controlled intersections. Not all driving examiners are going to use that language. Uh, some will, some won't. Okay? Some driving examiners will say, at the next controlled intersection, turn right. And they're talking about traffic lights. Essentially, they use that language because they want you to figure out what kind of intersection you're dealing with. So whether you're dealing with a stop sign, whether you're dealing with a yield sign, or whether you're dealing with traffic lights in a complex intersection. So know that for the purposes of a road test. Okay? But you want to back into the space because you're already nervous, you're already tense. You don't want to be trying to maneuver the vehicle and backing out of a parking space uh, when you get going on your road test. You want to be nice and easy. Just drive out, check both ways, signal, Make sure you signal in the parking lots too. Don't just signal on the roadway, okay? That's very important for the purposes of a road test. Anytime that you change the direction of the, of the vehicle or move it laterally, move it sideways, signal, 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 and shoulder check, okay? You can't shoulder check enough on a road test. Know that for the purposes of passing and being successful on your road test. Colin, I'm good. I now have a pilot's license as well as a private pilot, so that is where I've been. Excellent. That's really great. Congratulations on that, Colin. Uh, Maxi, for left turns, can we use one hand to turn or do we have to do hand over hand steering? Which steering method would you recommend? Okay, Maxi, uh, most places are going to be hand over hand, okay? Uh, what I suggest to students is to do a practice driving test with a local driving school seven to ten days before your road test a local driving school is going to be able to give you all the very deep the minor details that you need to have for the purpose of passing your road test very few places anymore even in the world do hand-to-hand -hand. Uh, some places in the UK will do hand-to-hand -hand steering some places here in the in the United States and Canada will do hand-to-hand -hand, but for the most part it's going to be hand over hand for manipulating the steering wheel uh, so that question I can't answer for your specific test center. And as I said, to fill in those details, 
hire a local driving school, go out, spend an hour, 90 minutes with them. Not only will they give you all the details and take you on the test route, but they also give you feedback on specific skills and abilities that you need to improve to be successful on your road test first time. It's money well invested, and I counsel uh, smart drivers to do that to be successful on their road test. All right, 380, another news is investigating multiple fatality, bus tractor trailer crash, fatigue of bus driver and winter road suspected on same day paramedics killed on side of road. Oh my God, there's just terrible stuff in the news today. Uh, Pandy, I took, few driving lessons with two different trainers and they both have different standards for certain things like parking mirror adjustment how can i pass the test this way <laughs> okay pandy all right if they're telling you different ways to do different things figure out what works for you okay basically what you're doing and yeah and that's the problem that i have with different trainers and this is the same thing that i said when I talked about CDL training and if you're going to investigate a truck driving school, make sure that you get all your training with the same instructor because this is what happens. This is one instructor will tell you to do it one way and one instru another instructor will tell you to do it a different way and it confuses you. Now you're left with questions. So for the purposes of parking, for the purposes of doing your maneuvers and those types of things, shoulder checking, head checking, make sure that you do that, make sure that you signal uh, you know, do what works for you in terms of parking along a curb, parallel parking, three-point turns, and park reverse stall parking, backing into a parking space, okay? So, no for the purposes of a road test, those three, okay? Parallel parking, three-point turn, reverse stall parking, so backing into a parking space. Those are the minimum that you need to know for the purposes of a road test, because for a road test, seven-eighths of it is in a forward motion, one eighth of the road test is those maneuvers. It is those maneuvers that give drivers the most difficulty, okay? So just practice those and adjust them. You don't have to do, you know, if some one thing that one instructor says to you doesn't work out for you, try something else. But whatever works for you, know that whatever you get taught in terms of how to do something, make it work for you. There are certain fundamentals and certain hard rules in terms of driving but on the other hand there are a lot of things that can be flexible okay and that's one of the things that can be flexible uh do -do -do. carrie what's the best way to scan a busy intersection to make sure nothing is missed what to notice everything when scanning road signs traffic lights changing okay so carrie when you're coming up to an intersection approximately half a block from the intersection uh for those of us who drive on the right <coughs> left center right left again okay so as you're approaching the intersection you want to scan left center right and then left again because the where you're going to get t-boned if somebody is running the traffic light is you want is from the left so you want to check left twice okay and that's the reason that you want to do that now you want to you know, roads uh, road signs not road signs intersections are of one of two types as we talked about before they're either uncontrolled intersections and usually uncontrolled intersections are minor roads that intersect with major roads so you're on a major road and there's minor roads coming into it those are uncontrolled intersections and basically as you're driving in a forward motion you just want to scan the intersection left right and then carry on that's fairly straightforward okay and if there are cars approaching the intersection at uncontrolled intersections you just want to make sure that they're coming to a stop so that's uncontrolled intersections. Controlled intersections are going to be stop signs, yield signs, or traffic lights. And, the, and traffic lights will range from simple two-lane roads with a traffic light or complex intersections with advanced turning lights, left turning, multiple lanes, those types of things. So you And slip lanes, right-hand slip lanes, turning lanes, and whatnot. So you kind of, you can classify intersections and then that will allow you to fill in a lot of the information really quickly as you're approaching the intersection and then you can sort out the nuance and the different things that may be different at different intersections okay as you're approaching the intersection so stop signs okay fairly straightforward it's either going to be a two-way stop sign or it's going to be a four-way stop sign if it's a two-way stop sign uh 
right of way is major roads over minor roads, straight through traffic over turning traffic, and right turning traffic over left turning traffic. So that's right of way for a two way stop sign. Four way stop signs, first vehicle to arrive, the vehicle on the right. When it's busy at a four way stop sign, it's essentially going to one lane of traffic and then the cross traffic is going to go. Okay, and again, all the other rules apply for four way stops. Okay, left turning vehicles over, or right turning vehicles over left turning vehicles, and straight through traffic over turning traffic. So if you come up and there's a car here and a car here, and this car is turning and you're going to go straight, but it's your turn to go, you have the right of way over the turning vehicle. Okay, but again, as we say here over and over again, the right of way is always given, it's never taken. So if the turning vehicle is going to insist that they're going to go before you, you're going to give them the right of way and let them go, okay? Because you're just not gonna risk a crash. Now, major, so we talked about that, yield signs as well. Yield signs at conventional intersections are rare. Most of the places that you're going to find yield signs are on freeway interstate ramps, uh, slip lanes, right-hand turning lanes at intersections and roundabouts. Those are where you're gonna find yield signs. It's unlikely you're gonna find yield signs at conventional intersections. I did videos on them here in Vernon and I had to look pretty hard <laughs> for yield signs at conventional intersections. Uh, yield signs, you don't have to uh, come to a complete stop if the way is clear, but slow down, check that the way is clear and then proceed at yield signs. And then finally, complex intersections, okay? Complex intersections as you're approaching are gonna be two lanes most of the time. They might be three lanes. You need to figure out which lane you're gonna be in and then whether you're gonna turn right or not uh, at the complex intersection. And most complex intersections, if they have left-hand turning lanes, are going to have advanced uh, left arrows, okay? So they're gonna allow left turning traffic to turn on an advanced arrow. This reduces the amount of conflict in the intersection and reduces your chances of being involved in a crash. So there's some tips and strategies that you can use to figure out what kind of intersection you're dealing with as you're approaching the intersection. Uh, Cody, confidence is very important for passing a road test. If you're not, if you're not the nervous, the examiner won't be nervous. Yes, it is. But know, Cody, that most people, even me, and I've taken a lot of road tests, a uh, lot of road tests, yeah. I cannot speak a good English. Uh, Road, I've taken a lot of road tests. I've taken at least half a dozen eight road tests. I've taken road tests for my car, straight truck, bus, tractor trailer, instructor's license. Uh, I had to redo my license when I went to Australia. So I've done a number of license tests. You're always gonna be nervous. You're always gonna be anxious. But the key to being confident is knowing that you're gonna be anxious and just putting that aside and doing what you need to do, focusing in. I talked about this last week in terms of getting in the zone. It's the same thing as what I do here, right? Doing the live stream, I get in the zone, right? I'm not really focused on what else is going on. There's no kids here this week because it's, it's not my week for kids, but you gotta get in the zone, right? You gotta know what you need to do and you do that and you focus on what you're doing, right? And that is very important for the first five minutes. Know what you need to do and get in the zone and do what you need to do to pass the road test. And this is, here's another critical point. And I'm gonna do a video on this because this is information that people need to know. Know what's on the test. <laughs> I can't stress that enough. Know what is required of you on the test. And this is why I counsel you to take a practice driving test with a local driving school. If you're in the state of Ohio, you're gonna to have to do the Ohio maneuverability test. If you're in the province of Ontario, you're gonna to have to do an emergency stop and know how to do that for the purposes of the road test. If you're in the state of California, you're gonna to have to back up for 10 or 12 car lengths along a curb. If you, if you show up at the road test and you don't know what's on the road test and you haven't practiced, two point reverse turns, you haven't pa practiced curb parking, you haven't practiced parallel parking, you, you haven't done your homework. You haven't done the work that you need to do to be successful on your road test. So know what is expected of you on the road test. And the other thing that I say to students who are going for a road test, go in on the holidays, go in on the weekend to the test center, 
figure out where you have to park the vehicle, figure out whether you can back into the parking space because some test centers won't let you back into the parking space. They have signs that say you can't back into the parking space. So figure all this out. To be successful on any test at, in, in life, you need to know what's on the test. You don't just show up at your English test in high school and not know what's on the test. You didn't go and read, uh, you know, um, Wuthering Heights, and that's not even on, on the test. <laughs> it's not even on the test. Uh, you know, it's the Great Gatsby that's on the test. So if you want to be successful in high school, you need to know what's on the test, and the teacher's going to tell you what's on the test. If you show up at class and listen and take some notes, you're going to know what's on the test. It's the same thing with a road test. You know exactly what's on the road test. And if you know exactly what's on the road test and you've done your homework and you've studied and you've prepared, you're going to be successful on the road test and it's going to greatly reduce your anxiety. Okay? So there we go. Get in the zone. There we go. Yes. I can put that on a t-shirt, Cody. I should, I should really write that down. <laughs> there we go. Because I'm thinking of t-shirt ideas. I need to come up with something much more interesting than just the Smart Drive Test logo. Uh, Jonathan, hello my friend. Uh, finally made it back. I'll answer any questions. Yes, and Jonathan is really excellent. Jonathan drives a bus there in the city of New York, and he's really great at answering questions. Uh, did it, Maxi, even if it's not a mall parking lot, the parking lot at the test center can be full and the space is limited uh, between the lots. Uh, okay, so Maxi, I may be missing something here in terms of what you were asking me. And my friend Tim over at Drive Smart BC, uh, Tim has excellent, excellent information over there. Uh, Tim is a re retired police officer and has the Drive Smart BC website that has great information about regulations and interpretation of legislation and helps drivers to be smarter, especially in the province of British Columbia. So check out his stuff as well. Uh, and, and Tim is saying uh, drivers have trouble with yield signs. They must yield to all other traffic, which includes pedestrian, cyclists, and even horse riders. Yes, and the other one that I would add to that as well, Tim, is uh, the new road user we now have is scooters. Uh, people on mobility devices in wheelchairs and scooters and those types of things and uh, I don't know where you live there on Vancouver Island Tim if you get a lot of them driving down the side of the roadway uh, but even here in Vernon we get quite a number of them uh, in the bicycle lanes so this is another road user so we have different road users on the roadway that we talk about road users people who are using the roadway so we have pedestrians cyclists, motorcycle riders, car drivers, truck drivers, bus drivers, trams and trolleys for those of you in the city of Melbourne, Australia, for those of you in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, as Tim said, horses. Now we have scooters and wheelchairs and these are all the road users that are vying for road space. <laughs> that are, you know, they're all competing for road space. So be looking out for all of those different types of road users who are competing for road space and there's, there's a huge conflict uh, in urban planning, the development of cities between uh, uh, cars and bicycles, right? Because we're putting in huge numbers of bicycles. So, uh, you know, think about different kinds of road users and where they're going to be uh, in on the roadway as well. There we go. Okay, so Tim is saying that there's very few bicycle lanes uh, and people on wheelchairs and mobility devices north of Nanaimo there on Vancouver Island. Okay, uh, Marty, height is subjective. When you say height is subjective, what do you mean by that? Oh, snowmobile drivers. Excellent. Thank you, Marty, for that. Yes, snowmobile drivers as well. Snowmobiles are going to be vying for road space in many places where they have snow, and this becomes... Uh, you know that they're riding snowmobiles I completely because I mean here where we live in Vernon we don't have very many snowmobiles in town but when I go home to Ontario uh, I see them all the time people uh, riding the snowmobiles in town going to the coffee shop or the restaurant or whatnot and where my mom lives in uh, Wingham Ontario you have the Mennonites uh, horse and buggies and those types of things so those are other road users as well so there's a huge list of road users on our roadways who are all trying to vie for road space. So keep that in, in mind. Okay, uh, Jonathan, t-shirt idea. Red means stop, green means go. <laughs> yes, well, 
And I'm just going to clear one up on red. Uh, green means go. Green means go if the way is clear. <laughs> if the way is not clear, you don't want to go. Okay? That's one of my uh, favorite questions uh, to students when I'm teaching them how to drive in the vehicle. This is what does green mean? And they'll always say green means go. You know, green means go if it's clear. Because you don't want to go if it's not clear. <laughs> All right. Maxi, I'm going to resend this again. My fear rear lights got damaged yesterday when I stopped at the mall parking lot and one car... Uh, suddenly reversed out of the lot and bumped into mine. Whose fault will this be? Uh, it's it's always really difficult when that happens in parking lots, Maxi, because uh, it's difficult to assign what happened. I mean, if you were stopped or weren't in the vehicle, you know, it's going to be difficult. I'm hoping that just insurance will fix it for you. But was it just the plastic lens that got broken because if it's just the plastic lens and it's cost, going to cost you a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars it might be easier just to pay the hundred dollars or two hundred dollars and just if there wasn't any damage to the body of the vehicle to just get those fixed and then carry on uh you know i know it, it i know it's a real drag but that's what i might suggest to you uh carrie what is a good way to train oneself to notice all road signs at intersections don't like being surprised when the lane i'm traveling in changes into a turning lane or will end by an intersection yes lane end sign this is one of the cautionary signs that you do need to pay attention to and we have one here in vernon uh when you're heading across number 27 the lane ends right and you have to merge over one of the ways to know that is to be looking down the road farther down the road and watching the traffic patterns. If, the, if you're watching the traffic and the right-hand lane is trying to move over constantly, then you know that there's probably a lane merge sign there. But it's just a matter of training yourself to be looking at road signs. And one of the ways that you can do that is by doing run and commentary. And there's a speed sign, there's a, uh, obst uh, there's a cautionary sign that's telling me to pass on the right. There's uh, an overhead height sign that's saying 13 feet, eight inches. Uh, you know, and just reading out the signs aloud and doing a run, running commentary will help you to read the road signs and get you in the habit of looking at and reading and gleaning the information from road signs. So try that. Corey as well will put up the video on running commentary. And I do encourage you to do a running commentary while you're learning how to drive and practicing your driving because that will really accelerate your learning and it will get the information into your head and the more information you get in your head, now know this about any learning, the more we know, the more we can learn, okay? So at the beginning of driving, for example, when you first get in the car, you're kind of like overwhelmed, right? The pedals, the steering wheel, the gauges, the dials, the knobs, the, everything else in the vehicle, and you're trying to figure out what all this stuff is, right? And then you go out and drive and you're looking at all the road signs and there's so many different kinds of road signs, there's different kinds of roads and oh my God, it's just so overwhelming. But the more practice you get, and I encourage you, and I talked about this in the previous weeks, that in the year that, or however half a year that you have your learner's license, drive as many different vehicles as you can with as many different people as you can. This will, again, make you more confident for the test because when the tester gets in your vehicle, you're just going to be like, oh, it's another person and I've already done all the work. I've already driven 110 different cars. I've already been in the vehicle with 10 different people. That way, it's going to be a lot easier for you when you go for the test. And you're going to be able to learn more the more practice you have. It's like myself. The years and years of experience that I have, I can get in new vehicles and go, oh yeah, this is the same, this is the same, but then the telematics is something different. But I can learn that very quickly because I already have a huge base of information on which to add more information. In the beginning, it's really tough, but as the more and more you learn, the easier it is to begin to catalog and sort out information in the driving world. And that's what I suggest to you, okay? Uh, 380 also said multiple comments are lost in the feed referencing collisions, transmissions, grade speeds. When these appear later, could you please reply via mastermind or messenger? Yes, I can. I will definitely go back and have a look because I know it's been really busy today, 380, uh, with the comments and whatnot. So I'll go back and try and sort some of those out and answer those. Uh, so we'll go with that as well. Alan, golf carts. Yes, if you're living near a golf course. Excellent. Lots of people putting in with the different types of road users and whatnot. 
Polo, I uh, just drove home on the highway for the first time by myself. Just got my first car last week. I had been binge watching all of your videos for the past month and helped me with my confidence so much. That is absolutely phenomenal news. And it's there's nothing more gratifying than going and getting your license, getting your first car. A friend of mine, her son is getting his first car right now and driving on your own. This is, it's just awesome. Uh, you know, and when, when smart drivers tell me that, that they just bought their own car, they drove on the highway by themselves for the first time, incredible, just incredible. And I, I, you know, it just, it's really great. And that's really awesome news for me. And I just love really hearing those news and helping people out. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, 380. Yeah, one of me uh, trying to keep up with everything here. Uh, Saba, my G2 exam on Wednesday and my instructor is telling me not to get under pressure and I'll do fine, but how? <laughs> breathe. <sighs> Just take a breath, do what you need to do, and you'll be fine. Okay, excellent. Uh, Jaden, I uh, just want to confirm this with you. Does taller Mercedes Sprinter passenger vans can fit in most car washes? Poshmark. Uh, no, I wouldn't think that, you know, oftentimes you would need to go in and talk to the people who are running the car wash. And actually, I might do a video on this because lots of people are getting their cars washed. Uh, if you have a, a, a big truck or a big van, uh, definitely go in and talk to them before you try and shoot it through the automatic car wash. Don't just go into the car automatic car wash because it may not fit. Okay. Marty, a double yellow, rural roads. Is it legal to pass a slow-moving vehicle with a orange triangle? Yes, you can. Okay. and make But make sure... Uh, you know, make sure that it's safe to do so, that you're not passing on a hill, you're not passing on a curve or those types of things. Uh, most of the time, if it's, a, if it's a slow moving vehicle, you know, maybe you might have to stay behind it, especially if you're on a road test. I wouldn't do that on a road test, but you know, you can't stay behind these slow moving vehicles forever because if they got a slow moving vehicle sign on the back of their uh, tractor or forklift or industrial piece of equipment or whatnot, uh, they're only, they're doing less than 40 kilometers an hour. So you could be there for a while. So you somehow have to figure out how to get around them. Okay. Uh, so know that, uh, okay. Um, which is better morning road test or afternoon road test? I would say that any road test kind of between 10 and two in the, in the day is going to be better. It depends really where you live and where the test center is, because if you're in a large metropolitan area, and you have to get out on highways or those types of things, uh, it could be really busy and get congestion. You have to realize too that when you're taking a road test, driving examiners know that it's busy. And if, if, if they have a road test at 4.30 in the afternoon and it's rush hour, they're not gonna take you out on the interstate. They're not gonna take you out on places that are congested because they have to get back too. Because test centers have to do a certain number of road tests each day. And remember, they do this every day, so they know where they can take you. They're just going to take you into a residential area. They're not going to take you uh, someplace that's super busy where you're going to have to drive in congestion and those types of things. All right. Krista. Hey, Rick, I was at a blind intersection the other day and forgot to look left. I almost got T-boned. Yes, and sometimes we make mistakes, okay? We make mistakes. Even as many years as I've been driving, unfortunately, I still, too, make mistakes, Fortunately for you, and fortunately for many of us, when we do make mistakes, it turns out to just be a learning experience. And we know we will never do that again. <laughs> we have those close calls, we do something wrong, and then we know that we're not going to do that again. Okay, so awesome. It's just a learning lesson. You learn something, and you're going to be great. Okay, Marty, trains and trolleys are taking up road space too. Yes, they are. We talk, I said trams. Trams in Melbourne. Trolleys, uh, yes, and they take up road space. Excellent. Saba, how to determine the curb distance when parallel parking? I do it fine, but really uh, get near the curb when making the 45 degree angle. Yes, and it's just a matter of practice. Uh, also, Saba, there's a video on uh, fine tuning things that are going to have to change. So for example, if you're parking behind a wide vehicle, you're gonna to have to come deeper into the space. If the vehicle that you're parking behind is out from the curb, again, you're gonna have to go deeper into the space. So you're gonna to have to look at the vehicle as you're going up and preparing to parallel park. Uh, again, Corey will put the video up for you on that. There's another video on parallel parking. Uh, 
Nori, okay, just to repeat, the only time that you have to follow school zone signs is when school is in session. Jaden, uh, hey Rick, my dad wants to sell his truck for Mercedes van, but I wasn't pretty sure, but I love his truck. <laughs> uh, excellent, yes, but if he needs the van, he, you know, it's probably a better thing for him to do. Epic, I'm taking a road test on recreational vehicle and commercial vehicles. The clearance sign is important because they ask you for it for both car and commercial vehicles. Yes, and there in the States, Epic, uh, the maximum height of commercial vehicles is 13 feet 6 inches. But you're living in New Jersey, so you're very close to the state of New York. Know that in the state of New York, height signs are from the center of the hub. And most height signs in the state of New York, you can go under when it says 12 feet 6 inches. They still haven't corrected this in the last 30 years. It was like that when I drove in the 1990s, which really can cause some serious butt clenching. <clears throat> at times when you're driving in the state of New York and it says 12.6, you're not really sure whether you can go under it. Peters, I uh, just passed my G2 road test two weeks ago. Thanks to your channel. Just want to say thank you. And thank you so much for stopping by and let us know. Congratulations passing your G2 road test there in Ontario. And stay with your two years. And this is the other thing that I'm now going to encourage. This is something I realized the other day. People get into the novice phase of their GLP or their GDL, and they stay there. They're 25, 30 years old, and they're still in their GDL. Yes, I know that there are greater restrictions, and they, they will drive under those greatest restrictions, but your insurance isn't going to start to go down until you get a full license. So get your full license so you can get less, you can get better premiums on your insurance. That is the incentive for going and getting a full license. And as well as that, there's better, there's less restrictions on you in terms of driving uh, when you have your full license. So get out of the GDL as soon as you can. Uh, lots of signs pertain to motorcycles. Yes, and uh, certainly on road speeds and those types of things. And you certainly want to pay attention to road surface conditions, whether it's raining, uh, it's slippery, a bit of gravel on the road and those types of things. There's a lot of things you got to pay attention to when you have a motorcycle license or are driving and operating a motorcycle on the roadway. Uh, Maxi, there is no other speed limit, so assume to be 50 kilometers an hour. When do we slow down to 50 kilometers an hour? Okay, so Maxi, excellent point. Road test speeds, uh, know that unless otherwise posted inside the city, it's 50 kilometers an hour, 30 miles per hour. Outside the city, it's 50 miles per hour or 80 kilometers an hour. It, unless otherwise posted okay so if there's a sign there's no sign you don't know how fast to go inside the city do 30 miles an hour or 50 kilometers an hour depending on where you are is how fast you have to drive okay excellent running near the end here <laughs> 380 yes clinchy clinchy for sure uh yeah i, I can remember that coming up the the um Brooklyn Queens Expressway and looking at the signs overhead, every one of them's like 12 8, 12 9, and you're just like. <laughs> uh, Carrie, thank you for sharing all of your great driving advice and knowledge with us. You are most welcome. Uh, Jaden, I watched a TikTok video and a driver in a Mini Cooper and Florida drove right into a train and got hit. And yes, there's unfortunately lots of those on the. Uh, there's lots of those on the internet. There's lots of those fails, lots of trucks driving across multiple tracks and uh, they don't, the train goes through on the one, they don't stop to wait and another one comes through and they've already getting across the tracks and just completely creams the truck as it's going across the railway crossing. So yes, unfortunately that does happen as well. Uh, okay, so here's the question of the day, TikTok. Uh, Jaden just mentioned TikTok. Is TikTok another periscope that it's going to come and go? Or is it going to stick around and people are actually going to go over there and take off on TikTok? All right. Uh, <laughs> 380, have a great night. Dr. August, thank you for your time, effort, and cheeky wit. Thank you so much for showing up. All the best. Okay. So I think we got everybody. Awesome. Again, check out the Defensive Driving course over at the Smart Drive Test website. It's on sale. Uh, and definitely that will keep you safe on the roadways and reduce your chances of being in a crash. And Tim just reminded us, lanes and alleys and municipalities, 20 kilometers an hour. Yes, excellent. And you need to know that for a knowledge test. 
Uh, 20 kilometers an hour is 12 mi or 10 miles an hour. That would be 10 miles an hour in the States. I know that the manuals in the States say 10 miles an hour in alleys. Here in uh, British Columbia, it's 20. Most provinces in, uh, in Canada are all 20 kilometers an hour. Uh, Marty, what about getting your boating license? Yes, that is something completely outside of Smart Drive Test's objective. <laughs> but there's lots of websites I know that will help you to get your uh, boating license. So, thanks so much. Thanks for all the questions. Really super busy today. Great uh, live stream. Thank you everybody for participating. All the people that got their license in the last couple of weeks, congratulations. And if you're going for a road test in the next few days, next week, uh, good luck on that. You're going to do awesome. Remember, in the zone for your road test, and you're going to be great. And know what's on your test and practice for that test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Bye now.